The third speaker today is Lawrence Jin, Assistant Professor of Finance at Caltech. In his not so distant past, Lawrence earned a master's degree at Caltech in electrical engineering, which he followed by a stint on Wall Street. He then earned a PhD in finance from Yale, and our last speaker, Nick Barbaris, was his advisor. And he's going to help us with answering at least two of the questions that were raised earlier, which is, are faculty rational? Although the evidence is consistent with no. Uh, and then the issue of psychological values and decisions about entrepreneurship. Uh, Lawrence works on the applications of insights from psychology and behavioral economics to stock market performance, both over time as in bubbles and crashes, but also in a cross-section of asset valuations. And that is going to be the focus of his talk today, Prospects Theory and Stock Market Anomalies. Lawrence, take it away. OK, so thank you, John Lalong, for um, the introduction. So today, I will present some new research uh, that uses Prospects Theory, a very prominent um, framework of uh, intuitive judgment and decision making to help us understand the cross-section of stock uh, market anomalies. So let me start with some quick uh, overview of the field of behavioral finance. So in behavioral finance, we're trying to make sense of the data using models that make psychologically realistic assumptions about human behavior. So by and large, these assumptions can be put into two categories. So the first category is about investor beliefs. So in other words, about how people assess information about their trading skills or about the stocks they hold and how they make forecasts about stock market returns or key economic variables like the GDP growth or future inflation rate. The second category of this psychologically realistic assumptions is about investor preferences. In other words, about how people evaluate risk. So over the past three decades or so, researchers in the field of behavioral finance have made a lot of progress. So we see lots of models of investor beliefs and investor preferences that have found success in explaining a wide range of empirical facts about asset prices, about investor behavior, as well as firm behavior. So just to give you a sense of what we do, let me briefly go over a couple of models about investor beliefs. Um, our speaker, uh, next speaker, uh, Nick Barbaris, is going to go deeper in details about these models. So uh, one class of models uh, in, about investor beliefs is related to overconfidence. So this model, this type of model says that more overconfident investors tend to trade more frequently and have worse trading performance. So empirically, people do find that survey-based measures of overconfidence indeed predict uh, the frequency at which investors trade. Another class of models assumes return extrapolation, the notion that investors, real world investors beliefs about future stock market returns tend to be a positive function of the stock market's recent past returns. And this notion of return extrapolation has found strong support uh, from survey data and models with return extrapolation offer a simple and intuitive explanation for things like bubbles and financial crashes. As for models with investor preferences, we know that the central idea in psychology about risk attitudes is prospect theory. So I'll explain the key features of prospects here a bit later, but for now, let me just emphasize that this is a Nobel Prize winning framework that has been used to explain a very wide range of empirical facts. For example, facts about the aggregate stock market, uh, such as the equity premium puzzle, the fact that the long run average of stock market returns tend to be much higher than the long run average of interest rates, and as well as the facts like excess volatility puzzle, the fact that stock markets tend to be much more volatile uh, compared to returns implied by rational frictionless frameworks. And prospect theory is also quite helpful for 
understanding investor trading behavior. The most notable uh, example here is the disposition effect, the fact that people, investors tend to sell winning, winning stocks, winners too quickly while holding on to losing stocks for too long. At the same time, after decades of research on prospect theory, we still don't quite understand its implications for some very basic aspects of asset prices, namely the cross-section of average returns. For example, under mean variance preferences in which investors care about the trade-off between the expected return and the variance um, of the portfolio that they're holding, we get the capital asset pricing model, a famous rational benchmark model that gives you quantitative predictions about the cross-section of average returns. But what is prospect theory on the behavioral side? What is prospect theory's predictions about the cross-section of average returns? For example, what does prospect theory predict about the relative average returns of small cap stocks and large cap stocks, or of value stocks and growth stocks? We still don't know the answers to these very basic questions. So for the rest of the talk, I will present some new joint work with Nick Barberis from Yale and Bao Lian Wang from the University of Florida. So in this paper, we develop a new theory of asset prices in which investors evaluate risk, at least in part according to prospect theory. And then we show how the model can be used to make quantitative predictions about the average return on any risk key asset and hence about the cross section. And then we use the model to see if prospect theory can indeed help us understand 22 prominent stock market anomalies that we considered. So just to quickly summarize the results, we do find that the model is actually quite helpful for thinking about a majority of the 22 anomalies that we considered. For example, some very well-known anomalies like momentum, distress, idiosyncratic volatility, idiosyncratic skewness, and profitability. But also quite a few other anomalies like return on equity, post earnings announcement, drift difference of opinion, O score, and so on. Um, moreover, for several of these anomalies, the model explains not only the difference in average returns between the extreme death cells, between death cell 1 and death cell 10, but also more granular, more specific patterns in the average returns of intermediate death cells. So I'll explain the full intuition uh, for this a bit later, um, but for now, let me just briefly uh, talk about the key features of uh, prospect theory. So prospect theory has four important ingredients, reference dependence, loss aversion, diminishing sensitivity, and probability weighting. So let me explain each one of these four ingredients. First, uh, reference dependent is the notion that investors tend to derive utility from gains and losses rather than from final wealth level. So this ingredient capture this ubiquitous investor concern for how much money they could gain or lose. The second ingredient is about loss aversion, which says that people tend to have greater sensitivity to losses than to gains. For example, the displeasure from losing $100 seems to be much larger than the pleasure of winning the same amount of $100. And then the third ingredient is about diminishing sensitivity, which captures the fact that people tend to be risk averse over moderate probability gains. For example, preferring a $500 gain over a 50% chance of winning $1,000. And conversely, people tend to be risk seeking over moderate probability losses. For example, preferring a 50% chance of losing $1,000 over a certain loss of $500. So the last piece of this uh, prospect theory is probability weighting. So under probability weighting, investors tend to overweight low probability outcomes. So if you have a stock uh, that has a small chance of becoming the next Google, then the investors will overweight this small probability outcome and therefore become very excited about this uh, asset. And 
this probability weighting is motivated by the experimental evidence that people tend to be um, buying both insurance policy and lottery tickets. And one simple way of capturing this is to have people overweight the tails of a distribution they're thinking about. And finally, uh, a, a um, ingredient, uh, a component um, that is quite often coupled with prospect theory is something called narrow framing. So in traditional models, when people are thinking about adding a new asset into their existing portfolio, they tend to merge the new risk with their pre-existing risks and see if the combination is an improvement. However, in experimental settings, quite often we see that people evaluate this new risk at least to some degree in isolation, separately from the other risks that they're facing. And this is a notion called narrow framing. So in this paper, we'll be incorporating narrow framing partly because we think that it may be realistic in our setting that when people think, think about how much money they put into a stock, they think at least to some degree about the gains and losses of the stock itself. All right, so uh, for today's talk, I'm not gonna go into the technical details of the model. Uh, if you are interested, you can download the full paper from my website, but let me tell you the key intuitions that will be driving our results. So in an economy with prospect theory investors who engage in narrow framing, the expected return of a risky asset will depend in part on these three things. The asset's return volatility, including its idiosyncratic volatility with a positive sign. The asset's return skewness, including its idiosyncratic skewness with a negative sign. And finally, the asset's capital gain overhand, which is the gain or loss of the average investor holding the asset with a positive sign. So let me explain the intuition for each one. So first, for this positive relationship between return volatility and expected return, right? so similar to most of the traditional models, in our model, investors dislike volat volatility. So here, under prospect theory preferences, what happened is that loss aversion means that investors are averse to return fluctuations around the reference point. So OLs equal, they would demand a higher average return for more volatile assets. Now let's move on to gain overhand, capital gain overhand. So suppose that the investor has a gain in the asset, then he becomes risk averse according to diminishing sensitivity, that component of prospect theory. So in that case, he would like to sell the asset to realize the gain to consolidate the profit. So that selling pressure would push down the current price of the asset and push up its expected return. Conversely, if the investor has a loss in the asset, then he becomes risk-seeking. Uh, then what happens is that he wants to hold on to the asset or even buy more of the asset, hoping that it's going to break even in the future. And that buying pressure is going to push up the current price of the asset and then push down its expected return. So you can see that overall, capital gain overhand has a positive relationship with expected return. Finally, let's think about return skewness, right? So under probability weighting, remember that people are overweighting the tails of the distribution they're thinking about. So if there is an asset with a positive skewness, meaning that the asset has a small chance of giving you a very high return, then investors will become very excited about this asset and therefore require a lower average return on it. So the results you will see later in this talk just come from combining these three intuitions about volatility, skewness, and gain overhand quantitatively all together um, and then see the trade-offs. And now it's clear to capture all of these effects quantitatively, we need a model of asset prices that incorporates all the elements of prospect theory, all the four elements of prospect theory, and takes into account investors' prior gains and losses. And in the current literature, there is no model that does both, so in this paper, we build a new one. <laughs> 
So let's go to the application. Let's see whether prospect theory can indeed help us understand the 22 anomalies that we consider. So here is the list of all the anomalies. So you can see the usual suspects here, right? Like value, momentum, distracts, issuance, and so on. So to see if our model can explain a particular anomaly, here's what we do. We consider economy with 1,000 stocks. So there are 100 stocks in each anomaly that sell. So here are the 1,000 stocks. And now let's think about the size anomaly as example. So let me remind you that the size anomaly says that small cap stocks on average earn a higher average return than large cap stocks. So here are the small cap stocks and here are the large cap stocks. So in the model, we take every stock within each anomaly decile to be identical. So they all have the same characteristics, namely the characteristics of the typical stock in that anomaly decile. Then we want to compute the average return of all of the stocks. Now, because we assume that every stock in each anomaly decile is identical, they're all going to have the same average return. So all we have to do is to pick one stock from each of the 10 anomaly decels and compute their average returns. And then we say that in this case, the, the model explains the size anomaly if the typical stock from the small cap decel has a significantly higher average return than the typical stock from the large cap decel. As I said earlier, you know, to, um, the, the, in our, um, the expected return of an asset depends not only on its beta, but also on its volatility, skewness, and gain overhang. So to implement the exercise I just described here, we need to come up with empirical estimations of these three characteristics uh, for each of the typical stock in each um, anomaly decile. So let me tell you the empirical procedure of how we do this. So let's again think about the size anomaly as the example. So every month we sort all stocks based on size. So these are the small cap stocks and these are the large cap stocks. And again, that we assume that there are 100 stocks in each anomaly decile. Now to compute the beta of the typical stock, uh, from this decile, we just compute the beta of each one of the 100 stocks and take an average. And similarly, to compute the capital gain overhand of the typical stock in this decile, we just compute the capital gain overhand of each one of this uh, 100 stocks and then take the average. Finally, we want to compute the volatility and skewness over the next year for the typical stock in each of these 10 anomaly decils. And here, things are a bit trickier, partly because it's kind of difficult to come up with ex ante measure of people's perceived skewness. So we have considered quite a few possibilities, and here's what we've decided on. So here's what we do. For each month, we look at the, each one of these 100 stocks in this decile, we look at their subsequent one-year one return. So here are the subsequent one hundred returns for each one of the stocks. And then we compute the cross-sectional volatility of this 100 returns and call that the volatility of the typical stock in that anomaly decile. And similarly, we compute the cross-sectional skewness of this 100 returns and call that the skewness of the typical stock from that anomaly decile. And finally, we repeat this exercise every single month and then compute the time series average. Right, let me show you a concrete example of like what these numbers look like. So let me show you this result for the value, a different anomaly, the value anomaly. So remember that the value anomaly says that stocks, the value stocks with stocks with lower price to earning ratios on average earn a higher average return than the gross stocks, the stocks with higher price to earning ratios. So we find that the typical value stock has an annual standard deviation of 71% as compared to a lower level of 54.1% uh, for the typical growth stock. And the typical value stock has an annual skewness of 2.66 as compared to a lower level of 1.85 for the typical growth stock. 
And finally, the typical value stock has a negative overhun of minus 24.1% as compared to a positive overhun of 12.1% for the typical growth stock. So consistent with this example, you see for most of these anomalies that we examine, the typical stock in that cell one tend to have substantially different uh, characteristics uh, compared to the typical stock in that cell 10 along the three dimensions of return volatility, return skewness, and get capital gain overhead. Moreover, uh, these three characteristics, volatility, skewness, and gain overhand, they're strongly correlated across anomaly death cells. What that means is that if the typical death cell 1 stock is more volatile than the typical uh, death cell 10 stock, then it is also more highly skewed and trade uh, at a larger loss. So here I plot some scatter plots here um, of these characteristics across these 220 anomaly death cells. So you can see that skewness and volatility, they're strongly positively correlated. And this capital gain overhand and volatility, they're strongly negatively correlated at the anomaly death cell level. And then finally, the capital gain overhand and skewness are also negatively, strongly negatively correlated. All right, now let me show you some concrete results about how our model predict for all of these anomalies. Right, so here's an example for the momentum anomaly. Remember that for the momentum anomaly, it says that uh, if in each month you sort all the stocks in the cross section based on their past six to 12 months return, then past winning stocks tend to have better performance over the next three to 12 months compared to past losing stocks. So here in this figure along the x-axis, you see the death cells, anomaly death cells from one to 10. And then this red uh, dash line here is the empirical uh, pattern or the empirical alpha. So you can see that high momentum stocks over here in death cell 10, indeed they have higher average return compared to low momentum stocks here over death cell one. And the blue solid line here is the model predictions. You can see that the model indeed capture a large fraction of this empirical alpha spread, the difference between the alpha from death cell 10 and alpha from death cell one. And here are the results for the failure probability anomaly, the distress anomaly. So again, you can see that the model capture a large fraction of this empirical uh, pattern. And here are the results for the idiosyncratic volatility anomaly. And uh, here are profitability skewness and a few other anomalies that the model helped explain. So what is the intuition for why the model explains all of these anomalies? Well, for all of these anomalies, the stocks in the death cells with the lowest average return, so that's, let's say, death cell one over here for the momentum anomaly, death cell 10 over here for the distress anomaly, and then death cell 10 over here for the volatility anomalies. So all the stocks in these death cells, they're highly volatile, highly skewed, and trade at a larger loss. So the fact that they're highly volatile means that prospect series investors would like to charge a high average return on them because of loss aversion. And the fact that they're highly skewed and trade at a larger loss, however, leads prospect series investors to charge a low average return on them because of probability weighting and diminishing sensitivity. And overall in the model, the second effect, the combined effect from skewness and capital gain overhand quantitatively dominates the first effect, the effects from, uh, from volatility. So the model overall predicts a lower average return for those stocks consistent with the empirical facts. And another important thing I want to emphasize here is that for several anomalies, including this idiosyncratic volatility anomaly, you can see that the empirical alphas exhibit some kind of a concavity pattern. 
right, it's quite he uh, clear here that for this red dashed line, you can see that over many dead cells, the empirical alphas are fairly flat, but then they plunge as we move toward dead cell 10, extreme dead cell. And quite interestingly, you can see that the model also captured this pattern of concavity. What that means is that the model explains not only the difference in average recurrence between the extreme death cells, death cell 1 and death cell 10, but also more granular, more specific patterns coming out of intermediate death cells. Now, for several other anomalies, the model is not doing a very good job. Um, and the most notable example is the value uh, anomaly that we've talked about earlier. So here are the results uh, for the value anomaly. So you can see clearly here's the empirical pattern, here's the model prediction. They're not really uh, consistent with each other. So what's going on here? Well, the value stocks over here in decile 10, those are the stocks that are more volatile, more skewed, and trade at a larger loss. So again, that the fact that they're more volatile, these prospect theory investors to charge a high average return on them because of loss aversion. And the fact that they're more skewed and trade at a larger loss, these prospect theory investors to charge a low average return on them because of uh, probability weighting and diminishing sensitivity. And overall, the model predicts that the second effect dominates quantitatively. So the model generates low average return for those stocks, which is inconsistent in this case uh, with the empirical fact. Okay, so I think it's the time to conclude, right? So um, what we do here in this paper is that we present a new model uh, of asset prices that incorporate prospect theory. Remember that prospect theory is the central idea in psychology about risk attitudes. It's been around for decades, but people still don't quite understand its implications for some very basic aspects of asset prices, namely the cross-section of average returns. So what we do is that we show you how to incorporate prospect theory into a model of asset prices in a way that leads to quantitative predictions about the average return on any risky asset and therefore about the cross-section. And we found that the model is actually quite helpful for thinking about many anomalies. Uh, and for several of them, the model not only captured the difference um, of average returns between extreme death cells, but also this more specific patterns of average returns coming out of uh, intermediate death cells. And finally, in terms of future research, I think the broad agenda here is to bring more psychological realisms to models of financial markets. And here at Caltech, we have a very strong group of scholars who specialize, who, is, who are specialized in behavioral economics and, uh, behavior and neuroeconomics. So the hope here is that we can test the implications of some of these finance models using both field data and data from carefully designed experiments. So that's all I have for today. So I'm open to all the questions. Thank you.